Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Research Visiting Speaker Series. My name is Kim Ricketts, and I'm happy to welcome everyone here um, to speak to research. We have a bunch of great people coming up, and we're going to start listing those on the website, um, the research website, so you can see going forward. I know that most of you are here because you get the invitations and the announcements, but I thought it might be good to know moving forward um, who we've invited to research. Um, today, we get to hear from Scott Rosenberg, and Scott um, is the co-founder of Salon.com, where he began by serving as the technology editor and then the managing editor, and he is now vice president for new products. He's written for a variety of other um, journals as well. This book is fascinating. Um, his new book is Dreaming in Code, as you see right here, and I'm just going to read you a little excerpt by way of introduction, because I think this, this sets it up pretty well. Our civilization runs on software, yet the art of creating software continues to be a dark mystery even to the experts. Never in history have we depended so completely on a product that so few know how to make well. There is a big and frightening gap between our accelerating dependence on software systems and the steady but slow progress in our knowledge of how to make them soundly. It's an interesting story. He picks um, a single software plan to, um, to tell the story, and I'll let him describe it better. So please welcome Scott Rosen. Thank you, Kim, and thank you all for coming out today. I'm going to give you a little, just a little overview of the talk. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and Dreaming in Code, the book. Donald Knuth says software is hard. Why is that? Talk a little bit about communication and miscommunication, groups of people making software, and then some time for questions. Excuse me. Who's there? <laughs> Odd okay. It is. Anyway, okay, uh, thank you. so I assume that I'm talking to a room full of developers here, but I realize that may not be the case, and I've learned to adopt the test-driven approach. So can I just get a sense of how many of you are developers? Okay, maybe half. That's good. We'll have a good, good mix. Now, my first confession is that I am not a programmer. The last time that I wrote code that was anything more complicated than an HTML page or messing around with blog templates was about 30 years ago. Now, I did learn BASIC back then. And there is this quote that some of you may know from Edsger Dijkstra, a programming pioneer, said that if, basically if you learn BASIC, you are mentally mutilated beyond hopes of regeneration as a programmer. Now, some Developers I talk to agree with this, others disagree, but um, in my case, I think he was probably right. Now, there was a game that I loved called Sumer. As when I was a teenager in the 1970s, they were giving out free accounts at NYU at the physics building in Greenwich Village, and we would go and spend hours writing new subroutines for this game, Sumer. It was sort of like a primitive ASCII-based uh, SimCity. And I would sit there writing subroutines, and strange things would happen to my sense of time. I'm sorry. Um, that w I, would, I would emerge blinking hours later. And I would wonder, you know, how much time had passed. I had entered this state of uh, uh, that psychologists call flow, and that was it was pretty cool. But as for what I was accomplishing, this is a code that I wrote back then. This is the only extant scrap of my programming code. There was no less than sign. I was writing on a typewriter, an Olivetti portable typewriter, and there was no delete key as you can see. So I don't know, this is not even really what you would call spaghetti code. This is sort of like, I don't know, you could call it gruel or something. So I became a writer and an editor. And I worked for years at the San Francisco Examiner as a theater and movie critic. I always had this sort of closeted geek side too. And I noticed in the early 90s that the world of the arts that I covered and the world of geekdom were sort of converging. And I started writing about that too. 
Then the web came along, and I immediately knew it was where I wanted to be. As a kid, I published mimeographed gaming magazines. And you can tell this is mimeographed because of the bleed through. <laughs> and uh, self-publishing I loved. And when the web came along, I thought, this is really the same thing, only without all the folding and the collating and the stapling and the stamp licking. I loved it. So I joined a group of colleagues from the examiner. We left the paper together in 1995, and we started Salon. Now, at the start, we were really only vaguely aware that running a website might actually involve some technology. It took us several years to figure that out. And by 1999 or so, we'd figured it out. And we started doing some in-house development work on a content management system. At the time, there weren't too many of those, and we had to build ours ourselves. As the geekiest member of the editorial team, it fell to my shoulders to be one of the managers of this project. And it turned into a classic software disaster, kind of a death march. Everything was late, and nothing worked right. And when we deployed it, everything broke. And once again, I found myself up all night, and time stopped. But this time, it was not much fun. And we charged into this incredibly complex situation with little knowledge of the history or the scope of the problem. And we were just paralyzed when things went from bad to worse. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I don't know how that slide got in there. Now, very sorry. After the dust settled, I thought, OK, I'm ignorant. I don't know anything about this field. I've been a writer all my life. The only hands-on experience I had with programming was back in ancient times. I don't know how to do this, but somebody must have figured it out, right? So I hit the books. And I pretty quickly realized that, in fact, it's kind of an unsolved problem. And it's certainly not a simple problem. There are plenty of ideas out there, certainly, and a lot of good ones. But nobody has really found the one true way to develop software. I thought this could make a pretty interesting book. So I started working on Dreamy and Code in earnest in about 2002. And this was a time, you may recall, after the burst of the internet bubble. When a lot of people were, and particularly in the mainstream media, which was my world, were sighing with relief. They felt, this is great. We no longer have to worry about all of that computer stuff. We can go back and into our corners and not worry about it. And I knew that that was absurd. I was using the web more and more, and everyone around me was too. I was familiar with Bjorn Strostrup's line, our civilization runs on software. And I think it does. But everywhere I look, the people making the software seem to be having a hard time. Why was that? Now, I've always been a journalist and not a theorist. And I believe that telling stories is one of the best ways to get at the truth. This is one of my favorite storytellers, Spalding Gray. Narrative is the distillation of lived experience into a memorable essence. Stories are powerful. And my first instinct as a writer on this subject was to tell stories. I thought I would go out and find maybe a half dozen software projects and tell their stories, weave them together into a book, and use that as a way to get at some of these questions I had. About that time, it was uh, fall 2002, I read a column by Dan Gilmore in the San Jose Mercury News and told about a new project that Mitch Kapor, who had created Lotus 123, was uh, uh, launching. And it was called Chandler. It was going to be a new model personal information manager. It was going to be open source and peer to peer and help people cope with information overload. So I thought, great, this will be my first project. It was in the Bay Area. I was in the Bay Area. Wonderful. I called Kapor up, and I told him about the project. And he told me two things. First, I thought it sounded like an interesting book idea. Second, his project was not going to be a good subject, because it was atypical. He said, it's going to be driven by design, and most software projects are not. And also, the organization that was building it, called the Open Source Applications Foundation, or OSAF, was nonprofit, and that was atypical. And I actually felt that this made it even more interesting for me. Too often, it seems to me, 
we view the process of creating software solely through the lens of business. People understand money better than they understand programming, so it's understandable. But the story of software then becomes this tale that begins with an IPO, I mean, sorry, begins with raising venture capital, and then ends, if you're lucky, with an IPO. And the actual programming work from the actual project ends up being something that the writer kind of averts our eyes from, sort of like the way old movies would handle sex scenes. You know, you would see the romantic couple embrace at one point, and then there would be this fast cut to the next morning. You weren't supposed to look at this stuff. And the creation of software sometimes seems to be the same way. Uh, maybe writers think that it's just too complex, or maybe they think it's, they're worried that it's going to be boring to their readers, or they think it doesn't matter because, you know, it's just plumbing. Maybe you've heard that phrase. It's just plumbing. Who cares? Well, I wanted to fill in that blank and to kind of write about the fashioning of a piece of software in all its gory detail. I found it fascinating, and I thought the fact that Chandler was a nonprofit would actually give me the chance to tell a different kind of software story. So Kapor let me come down to his office. It was then in Belmont, California, and sit in on some development meetings. And before long, I found myself living and breathing Chandler. In addition to the meetings, there were mailing lists and blogs. Then there was a wiki that kept growing and growing. Later, there was CVS for tracking the code and Tinderbox for testing the code. And you could have CVS um, send you email, and you could keep up with the wiki via email or RSS. Chandler was supposed to solve information overload, but for me, it was causing it at that point. And I realized very quickly that my original idea of having six different projects and weaving it together was insane. It just wasn't going to work. It was too much for me to follow, and it would be too much to ask readers to follow. And I also realized that this one story would be enough to cover all the topics that I knew I had to include. Everything from Frederick Brooks and the Mythical Man Month to the history of software disasters, managing software teams, choosing tools and methodologies, communication between programmers and designers, the unfulfilled promise of reusable code, and most important of all, the problem of scheduling software, knowing how long things are going to take. So working on software really does strange things to time. When I first visited the Chandler team, they were saying that the product was going to be out in a year. So I immediately doubled the number. I said, two years, OK. And I got a book contract. I had a timeline. And I figured I've left enough room in this so that even if Chandler slips and slips again, it's all going to work OK. But after three years, as the deadline for my book began looming, Chandler still had a long way to go. They kept scaling back some of their ambitions and features in an effort to speed things up. But really, there was no way to say with any reliability how long it was going to take for them to finish. And that left me with something of a dilemma, right? How, how do I end a book before the story's over? And I'll, I'll let those of you who decide to read the book figure out, uh, see how I did that. But I will say for those of you who've studied any computer science that it has something to do with recursion and incompleteness and the halting problem. <laughs> so it's natural to look at all this and say, well, isn't this really just the story of a, pro a project that did a really bad job estimating its schedule? And the answer is, yes, it's true. But it's amazing how often that happens. And it doesn't only happen on relatively small projects like Chandler. It happens, it's kind of like the default on big government projects, right? You know, the IRS and the FBI's problems, probably things that some of you know about. And, you know, maybe some of you in this room have experienced some of this yourself. So when programmers hear about Chandler and say, what a bunch of losers, you know, I'd never do that. That could never happen to me. I say, hold on. You know, you've never worked on a project that started with a great ambitions and then found that it had to desperately scale back in order to get something done in your lifetime. I don't know. I think that happens more often than not. And it certainly happens on the most interesting projects that I encounter. Now, there isn't a lot of good hard data 
about success and failure in software projects. This report, the Standish Group's Chaos Report, is sort of the one thing that people keep returning to. It started in 1995. That original report said that only 16% of IT projects are successful. They define successful as on time and on budget with all features and functions as initially specified. 31% total failures, the remaining 53% project challenged. Don't you love that phrase? Challenged project, which they said means significantly over budget or late or reduced in scope. Now 2004, there's some improvement, but it's still not a great picture. Some people have challenged this uh, study recently, suggesting that there's a problem because the people conducting the study haven't um, shared their methodology. And that's a good point. But I think however you look at it, it it's not good news for the field. Now, sometimes I talk to developers about this. They turn to me and say, well, you know, building complex things, it's always hard. Why do we expect software to be any different? Well, I do think there are differences, things that make software unique. So let me talk about some of them from a relatively high altitude here. First of all, software at heart is a human construct. It's artificial. One question that always comes up is, why can't we build software the way we build bridges? Bridges are human constructs, right? But a bridge, really, if you think about it, is built with these molecules that are part of the natural world that obey predictable laws of physics and natural forces. We know that they're going to behave in certain ways. Software is made of parts that we invented sitting, in, sitting on top of other parts that we invented all the way down. In this, in some ways, it's more like a work of fiction than nonfiction. We write it, and we make it all up. Now, in his great book, The Mythical Man Month, Frederick Brooks wrote, the programmer, like the poet, works only slightly removed from pure thought stuff. He builds his castles in the air, from air, creating by exertion of the imagination. So software is almost pure thought stuff a product of the imagination. There's this dream that software engineering can evolve into a mature discipline and take its rightful place next to chemical engineering and mechanical engineering and so on. And program building could really become like bridge building. So that sends me to this quote from Peter Deutsch who said, it's very difficult to have real engineering before you have physics and there isn't anything even close to a physics for software. So. We make it all up. But it has to work. That's an interesting set of conditions to try to meet. Now, my background is in theater. And one of the great plays about the creative process is Ibsen's The Master Builder, which doesn't get performed much anymore. The lead character is this aged architect. And he has this uh, en encounter with a mysterious young woman from his past. She comes to him and keeps urging him to build castles in the air. But he's an engineer. So every time she says, castles in the air, he responds, yes, but with solid foundations. Now when I read this, I would scratch my head, go, what does this mean? And now that I've spent all this time studying software, I kind of think that this is a great definition of what we're trying to do when we build software. Um, it need, it, it, it's a castle in the air because it's an imaginative pro product, but it also needs a solid foundation because it has to work. So that's one big area in which I think software really is unique. Another one is that it's incredibly hard to visualize a complex program. That has practical consequences when we try to create it. We can't really touch it, right? We have a hard time measuring it in any useful way. I don't, lines of code doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, Feature points, it's usually apples and oranges, right? Unfinished versus done. When is a piece of software really done? So measuring it is really hard too. We have a hard time even talking about software. And I'm going to talk a lot more about that problem of finding a common language a little later. So we gather around whiteboards and we talk to each other and we draw boxes and arrows and we cross our fingers and we hope that the boxes and arrows and words mean the same thing to the other guy that they mean to us. Now I know that today there is a movement, um, some people are calling it Web 2.0, and in that corner 
the developers are thinking, well, this is all fine, this is great, but we do everything on the web now, and that solves all of our problems. And I agree with that up to a point. Web-based systems do solve one set of problems. And you probably know all these already, but I'll review them quickly. So end users are really bad system administrators, right? So you manage their data for them. Easy to apply patches and updates because you're doing it all on the server. The browser solves all your cross-platform issues. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to reinvent the interface each time you do a new application. And the web keeps you close to your users so you can get their feedback and fix things quickly. So that's great. Hooray. But moving to the web also introduces a whole other set of problems that we actually didn't have in the old days. The system depends on network connectivity. The browser represents a whole new point of entry for bad actors and malware. And so we turn to the New York Times and we see a headline like, Attack of the Zombie Computers. I love it. Um, we have privacy concerns. We're handing all of our data over to somebody else. We better trust them. And finally, we do all of this stuff in the browser, and we think it's really easy to do, but we find it's actually more complex. And the more stuff you do with these cool Ajax things in the browser, the more trouble you have with oddball users like me who insist on using strange browsers like Opera because it's less vulnerable to all of that malware that's coming in through the browser. OK. So more important than any of these specific things, though, is a larger point. And this is really the heart of the conclusion that I draw in Dreaming in Code. So I'm going to linger on it a little bit. I'm convinced, as I imagine some of you here are at least, that web-based systems really are the future right now. And they are going to be, uh, become where we move more and more of our work. That's possible precisely because web-based computing solves so many of the problems of the previous generation of software. They let us do things that we couldn't do before. That's great. But as a result, we'll ask them to do more and more. And eventually, we'll probably go too far. We'll start out amazed by the new capabilities of this web-based software. And then we'll end up being made miserable by their limitations and flaws. And the software industry will then move to whatever its next phase will be. I don't think this dynamic is a function of immaturity in the field. I think it's inherent in the nature of the work of the software field. We had a version of this discussion a few years ago. Some of you may remember this guy, Nick Carr, came out with an argument called IT Doesn't Matter in the Harvard Business Review. He basically said that IT doesn't matter because it won't provide your business with a competitive edge. Everybody's doing it now. It's really just a holding pattern where you have to accept that you're going to spend a lot of money on software, but you should try to get away with spending as little as possible. I think you know he was right up to a point. It's all true. But only if you believe that you've fully mapped the universe of what you expect your software to do. And I'm going to read one of two short passages today from the book here that addresses this. So IT doesn't matter as long as you know in advance that the things you expect software to accomplish for a business, accounting or workflow automation, inventory management, you name it are not going to change, and that your competition is using software to accomplish the same set of things. But of all the capital goods in which businesses invest large sums, software is uniquely mutable. The gigantic software packages for customer relationship management and enterprise resource planning that occupy the lives of the CTOs and CIOs of big corporations may be cumbersome and expensive, but they are still just as much as the little spreadsheets that Dan Bricklin and Mitch Capor introduced to the world a quarter century ago made of thought stuff. And so every piece of software that gets used gets changed as people decide they want to adapt it for some new purpose. No sooner do you introduce a new system for employee surveys than a light bulb goes off over somebody's head. Hey, why can't we turn the same system into a tool to schedule our company parties? All it will take is a few tweaks. And while they're at it, maybe the development team will add a nifty way for me to catalog my music collection. Then we could vote on the music that we're going to play at those parties. Have we really already discovered and deployed all the usefulness and, yes, all the frivolousness, too, that software offers? To believe so seems not only arrogant, but actively ignorant of recent computing history. 
By the mid-1980s, for instance, business analysts were writing off the entire personal computer industry as mature and over the hill, just as the new wave of Macintosh and Windows-based computing was be beginning to build. In the early 90s, Microsoft was beginning to dominate the PC software industry, and the conventional wisdom was that the entire business was consolidating, yet the Internet was about to kick it in new directions. Over, the, over and over, those who have bet that there can be nothing new under the technology industry sun have lost their shirts. To believe that we already know all the possible uses for software is to assume that the programs we already possess satisfy all our needs and that people are going to stop seeking something better. But as long as we keep asking software to accomplish new things and solve new problems, fixing today's bugs still won't protect us from tomorrow's crashes. And although software methodologies are very helpful when you want to repeat a success, you can reproduce an outcome only if you have one to start with. If you're exploring unknown territory, best practices might help you move a little more quickly, but they're not going to point you to your destination. Software development is often compared to the construction industry, but the analogy breaks down in one respect. Even after we've learned how to build structures to solve particular problems, sheltering a family, say, or providing an appropriate space for treating sick people, we still need to keep building more of those structures. However much I may like your house, I can't have it myself. You're already living there. Software doesn't work that way. Once we know how to write a program to balance a checkbook or display a web page, each additional copy of the program costs nothing to produce. And the price you pay, assuming you pay at all, is to reward the people who, built it, who devised it, not to construct your copy. Therefore, once somebody has written a program that does exactly what you need it to do, it's always cheaper to buy that software than to build something from scratch. Time and time again, however, we find that what we need or want is just different enough from what's available that we have no choice but to write some new code. At Salon, for instance, in the late 90s, we realized we needed to automate the way we published our articles. The most popular software for content management at that time was a big package called Vignette had a six-figure price tag. A salesman from the company visited our offices and described its hundreds of useful features. Unfortunately, we had no need for most of them. But there were a couple of things we needed to do, and Vignette couldn't do them. So we hired some programmers to write our own system instead. Now, every writer about software sooner or later ends up offering a law under his own name. So the time has come for me, with all due humility, to do the same. I present Rosenberg's Law. Software is easy to make, except when you want it to do something new. <laughs> now, there is a corollary because there's always a corollary. The only software that's worth making is software that does something new. OK, I think you've gotten a little bit of a taste of what Dreaming in Code is about. I, I should also say that there are a lot of dogs in it. In my remaining time, I want to focus on one of the book's themes and extend it in a new direction. The one heart of the software problem is communication, right? There's communication with the computer, which is what you're doing when you program. There's communication with the user, which is interface design. And then there's also communication among the people who create a program. And that last category, I think, is in many ways the hardest, and that's what I'm going to focus on here. When a group of people work on a program together, they have to agree on a set of names, names for variables, names for controls, names for everything. Like Dilbert's manager says, 90% of this job is figuring out what to call stuff. So here is my one other passage that I'm going to read. This is all about the Chandler team's wrestling with naming things. As OSAF's developers struggle to transform the innovations in Chandler from sketch to functioning code, they repeatedly found themselves tripped up by ambiguity. Over and over, they would end up using the same words to describe different things. Take item. To the designers, an item in Chandler was anything a user thought of as a basic piece of data. A single email, an event on a calendar, a task or a note. But the back-end world of the Chandler repository, the database, also had items. And its items were subtly but substantially different from the front end's items. A repository item was a single piece of information stored in Chandler's database. And in fact, you needed many of these repository items to present a user of Chandler with a single user item, like an email. 
Each attribute of the user item, the subject line or the date sent, the sender's address, and so on, was a separate repository item. At different times in Chandler's evolution, proposals arose to resolve this problem, to disambiguate the word item. Maybe the term user item could always be capitalized. Well, that worked in writing, but not so well in conversation. Maybe another term for one or the other type of item could be adopted. Some of those proposed, like thing, were even more ambiguous, and none of the proposals stuck. The Chandler universe was rife with this sort of word overlap. The design team kept using the term data model to refer to the list of definitions of data types the user would encounter, along with all the attributes associated with that data type. For example, the data model would specify every note had a date created, an author, and a body text. But to the developers, data model referred to a different and more technical set of definitions that they used to store and retrieve data at the level of their code. What the design team called the data model was really in the developer's vocabulary, the content model. Then there was the problem with the term scheduled task. In the design world, the scheduled task meant an item on a user's to-do list that had a date and time assigned to it. But for the developers, a scheduled task was something Chandler itself had been told to perform at a particular time, like download email or check for changes in shared information. Or consider the term event notification. For the designers, this meant things like telling the user new mail had arrived. For the developers, an event was some change in the status of a code object, like a window closing or a click on a menu item. And notification meant sending news of that change to the other code objects. Kapor would observe these little linguistic train wrecks and shudder. We need to speak one language, he would say. We should all speak Chandlerese. We have to fix the vocabulary. Finally, Brian Skinner stepped forward to try to do just that. Skinner had joined OSAF as a volunteer and helped sort out the subtleties of the data model. Now a full-time programmer at OSAF, Skinner had a knack for explaining developer speak to the designers and design talk to the developers. When the groups talked past each other, he was often the one to sort out the language. Why not, he proposed, set up a Chandler glossary on the wiki? It would provide a single, authoritative, easily amended reference point for all the terminology floating around the project. Skinner took up arms against the sea of ambiguity. He produced dozens of glossary pages. He, he built a system for linking to them from the rest of the wiki. It was a heroic effort, but it didn't seem to make much difference. For one thing, the usage of the terms continued to change faster than his wiki editing could keep up. More important, the developers, who were already drowning in emails and bug reports and wiki pages, didn't seem to pay much attention to the glossary, and the pages languished mostly unread. The glossary's futility might have been foreshadowed by the outcome of another naming effort Skinner had been involved in. OSAF's Howard Street headquarters had a half dozen conference rooms, and KPOR decided it would be useful for them to have names. OSAF held a contest and solicited proposals from the staff. Skinner suggested using names from imaginary places, and he won the contest. The two main conference rooms became Avalon and Arcadia. The fanciful names captured the spirit at OSAF where imagining new worlds was on the collective to-do list. It was only later that everyone realized what a bad idea it was to have the names of the most frequently used rooms begin with the same letter. No one could ever remember which was which. So we can probably do a better job in the area of human-to-human -human communication, but it's never going to be perfect. There will always be errors on that line. Unlike in the world of network protocols, people are capable of finding value in these errors. We misunderstand something and find something that we actually like. In her wonderful novel of programming, The Bug by Ellen Ullman, which I heartily recommend, um, she has this great passage that riffs on the C command, malloc. Now, if you're a programmer, you know what it is. It's a way to allocate memory in a program. If you're not a programmer, you hear this word malloc. It sounds like some kind of biblical incantation of evil. <laughs> if you're not an expert in a particular field, sometimes you just hear stuff differently. So one of my favorite albums as a kid growing up in the 1970s was the Grateful Dead's Live Dead. It has this song in it called The Eleven. 
Now, I was reading a lot of Tolkien at the time, and if you know the Lord of the Rings, you know there are all of these groups of people who have rings. There's the three and the five and the seven. For some reason, they're all odd numbers. Um, and so I heard the 11, and it just it sounded magical to me. I thought it was this beautiful thing. Years later, I discovered what the song name really meant. It's a reference to the odd time signature that they use in the song. Instead of like a 4-4 march or a 3-4 waltz, the song is in 11-8. So the title was really just musical shop talk, and I was projecting all of this poetry onto it. My point is, when we misunderstand one another, sometimes we please ourselves, and sometimes we can even come up with useful new ideas. We m rip something out of its original context, and we find a new path to some desired goal. Misunderstandings can actually be viewed not as bugs to be eradicated, but as accidents that can enrich us. And we should try to stay open to those accidents. The Wall Street Journal's Lee Gomes recently ran a piece uh, about the early history of semiconductors. And I love this story. I want to read just a couple of sentences from it to you. Uh, I'm quoting Stanford professor Thomas Lee. He said, William Shockley had been given a very vague mission to find a solid replacement for vacuum tubes. Starting in the 1940s, Shockley and a band of stalwarts worked on the problem, but they failed repeatedly and spectacularly. So they switched gears and said, what are the reasons for our colossal ignorance? One of Shockley's employees, a guy named John Bardeen, designed a series of incredibly brilliant experiments to diagnose their failures. But one of the experiments was itself capable of amplification, just like the vacuum tubes they were trying to duplicate. So the initial invention of the transistor was something they stumbled on while they were trying to diagnose their earlier failures to invent a transistor. So transistors replaced vacuum tubes everywhere, right? Well, not quite. Electric guitarists love vacuum tubes because of the particular warm kind of distortion that they create. Distortion is another one of these happy accidents. It's signal degradation, right? It's a bug. A good amplifier has very low distortion. Only early in the history of electric guitar playing, Link Ray discovered that distortion actually sounds great. And he started doing something that later Ray and Dave Davies of the Kinks did as well. They took pencils and poked them through the cones of their speakers to get a better distortion sound. So one man's signal degradation was another's beauty. And your bug can sometimes be a breakthrough if you look at it from a different angle. Now, I don't know if any of you saw the article that came out a week or two ago in a magazine called Baseline about the early development of MySpace, but it's fascinating. Um, it talks about uh, you know, all the problems they had in getting MySpace going. And if you know MySpace, you probably know that one of its most uh, popular features is the fact that the service lets you make your page be as ugly as you want it to be. And it turns out that this feature was actually a bug. The uh, developers had forgotten or failed to put in the filtering to filter out the formatting that the users could put in when they did their, uh, uh, when they input their content. And then eventually, of course, they figured out that they should not fix that bug. So the old joke that you know, it's not a bug, it's a feature, what if that's not a joke? What if it's wisdom of some kind? Now, Brian Eno, the musician and producer, says he doesn't read the manual for new devices when he gets them in the studio. He wants to figure out all the different things they can do, not just the things that the people who created them uh, uh, wanted you to use them for. In essence, he's taking tools and products that were offered up as scientific entities and treating them as artistic media. Now, one theme of Dreaming in Code is this whole question, is programming really an art or a science? It's one of these questions that will never be resolved. Plainly, it's some of both. And I think Eno has something useful to tell us about this. He calls it Eno's second law. I don't know what the first one is. Uh, science is the conversation about how the world is. Culture is the conversation about how else the world could be and how else we could experience it. He goes on to say, science wants to know what can be said about the world, what can be predicted about it. Art likes to see which other worlds are possible, 
to see how it would feel if it were this way instead of that way. As such, art can give us the practice and agility to think and experience in new ways, preparing us for the new understandings of things that science supplies. So, software is plainly right in the middle. It's sort of a bridge between art and science. When it works, it takes a little bit of a newly imagined world of possibility and injects it back into the predictable scientific world as it is. I think that's a pretty important undertaking. It's certainly more than just plumbing. And it's worth the effort to keep trying to do better, even as we know that we'll probably keep falling short. So that's the end of my presentation. I'd love to hear questions and comments from you all because I'm sure that a lot of you know more about the subject than I do. Thank you. Yes, please. There was one, one big software development thing that did, did, not, did not slip schedule, and that was a year 2000 bug fix, uh, which worked remarkably smoothly. Can you comment? The year 2000 bug fix. Um, yes, well, so uh, it, was, it was a predictable, that we, it was an event with a clear deadline, um, and we don't really know, well, one of the interesting things, I wrote about that at the time, I interviewed a guy named Ed Jordan who had predicted great disaster. Um, and it's one of those cases where we know that a lot of work got done in advance, and we know that there were no big disasters. What we don't know and can never know is, had we not done that work, would there have been big disasters? And I don't know enough about it to say, but um, there was a, I, I view that as sort of a great act of um, prevent, you know, of foresight and, and preventive care. Uh, it's the kind of thinking that we should be employing more in a lot of other areas like the environment, I think. Um, but at least, you know, the software field kind of kept its uh, 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 house in order there. So, yes, I think that's a good example. Please. Yeah, the bridge building metaphor is one that computer scientists... Uh, I'm sorry. About. The bridge building metaphor is, is one computer scientists talk about quite a bit. And uh, the last time I, I recall talking with somebody about that, they offered uh, also this twist on it. Um, we don't have generally people going around trying to blow up all our bridges, right? So if software is like bridges and we're building these things, you know, um, we've also got to do a lot more to defend them, mm -hmm. uh, at least. Uh, so that it, uh, so in a way, though, then, bri you know, the bridge building metaphor, uh, we, you know, the, the, we could extend it and talk about you know, military hardware. So in, 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 on the battlefield, there are other people going around trying to blow things up. And of course, in a battlefield environment, you are indeed much more focused on security. Um, but I would say that even if you take that, that aspect out of the picture, even if you say, you know, you imagine a hypothetical world in which there aren't bad actors trying to break your software, before any of that was really the case, back really before the, the internet was popular, when the problems with software were really limited mostly to our desktops, we still had lots of problems. So I'm not sure that that, I, it's, a, it's a further layer of complication uh, to the problem, I think, rather than uh, you know, something that uh, uh, changes the picture. Well, the interesting thing about software is the environment means a lot. So you, you didn't really talk about that. But when software was in a local area network and there was a buffer overflow, that was not exploitable. Mm -hmm. And once, now same piece of software, exactly the same piece of software changed the environment. So just like you're saying, you know, the bug might be a feature, you know, uh, in one environment, the bug has been isolated. In the other, it's exploitable. So I, I, I think yeah. the other aspect of software is that it is connected through physical devices to the real world. And in, in, in one environment, that software can be tamed. In the other, it can be exploited. And that environment changes all the time. Right. So that this piece of software, which was had a, a, a flaw that was simply a, you know, a minor issue, when you move that into a network environment, it suddenly becomes a, a security problem. But we also, uh, you know, we, we know that the environments are going to keep changing. So um, we can't, um, you know, we can't sort of turn the clock back in any way. We just have to kind of deal with that. Um, and in a way, I mean, I think that uh, if you think about other fields, if you think about architecture, well, if the worst predictions of climate change are accurate, 
um, and we see sort of the worst case scenarios there, um, a lot of buildings are going to face stresses and problems that were not part of the original environment that they were designed for, and that's going to be uh, a, a, big, a big deal. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, you were with the Chandler team for a while, I think, um, and you've discussed some of the problems that they've had. What can we learn from, uh, from their failures to uh, actually ship a V1 product in? Yeah, it's, it, it's a good question, and um, I, I, with Dreaming in Code, I deliberately set out not to write a book that would offer explicit lessons, because I felt there are a lot of books out there already. Um, many of them are very good. They're mostly written by people with a lot more experience than me, and I didn't want to, you know, kind of pretend to uh, some level of, uh, you know, hands-on expertise that I don't have. Um, so that's you know the, the the book is really designed to be a story that you can read and draw your own conclusions from. However, that said, I'm perfectly happy to tell you that you know the lesson that I came away from and the lesson that I'm trying to apply back at my job is don't start with um, you know a huge set of ambitions in multiple directions. Pick something small. Um, this is the same thing that Linus Torvald says. I quote him in the book, um, and I think it's the same thing that. Pretty much, you know, a lot of people, the same conclusion that people arrive at from multiple directions. Um, you start small and you build incrementally and you keep your gaze focused, you know, reasonably uh, on the next goal and you build your schedule around that and then you have the opportunity to correct course um, because you can see how far you got in a certain period of time. If you start um, with a very large set of, of goals. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't here and some of you were, um, so I don't know everything about the Vista, the Longhorn story, but um, I know that I, it was happening at the same time as the Chandler Project and I was following it from a distance and I read a lot of the stuff about the uh, WinFS and it sounded like a wonderful thing, like I wanted that. It sounded like, you know, it could really help, but I also wondered, uh, I thought, wow, this is a very ambitious thing. It's a hard thing to do. Can they do that and do all these other things at the same time? And indeed, it turned out um, that that didn't happen. So, um, you know, I, I think it's it's a lesson that seems to hold at all different levels of software work. At Salon, we've got two or three developers. At Chandler, they had two dozen. At Microsoft, there are thousands. Um, and I think the, it, it applies at, at all those levels. Uh, first, you. Yeah. So uh, there, there are any number of, uh, of good books that, that describe how you need to do uh, good estimation, good scheduling, good reporting, good research, good things, deadlines, etc. Uh, and you describe in the book whether these people in that particular project did the right things and somehow properly used the methodologies that they should have been using, or do they crossly, crossly misuse something? I think. Um, very hard to say because everyone, this, this is, was a group of experienced developers um, who they were not following a particular methodology, but they were certainly um, knowledgeable about many methodologies. Um, and I think part of it is that this was, uh, you know, uh, a unique environment where there wasn't a constraint of um, a certain amount of money that was going to run out because it was sort of a self-funded thing um, and a group of developers who had been given uh, a, a set of goals that may have just been too much. And so over time they evolved what became a, a, a very effective scheduling system but it took them, you know, that didn't happen for I don't know, uh, roughly two to three years, you know, and they, they got to a point once they had found that they weren't making progress the way they wanted to, that they started um, doing better. Uh, but at the beginning, uh, it was very free form. So, so in a way, this was not a typical project where you have a deadline of next Christmas, and then that's your operational time, and you have to figure out something. That's true. Yeah, it, it was not. It was. Uh, it didn't have a deadline of next Christmas, but it had a stated um, kind of, it had publicly stated at the beginning, they said a year, um, 
so it's different from a deadline because it's, it's not working. There isn't somebody who's going to cut off the funding or shut it down or something if it's not there. So in that sense, not a deadline. But on the other hand, it certainly had the pressure to, to try to do it. Um, you know, I, I, it, I, you know I, I, keep, I quote uh, Andy Hertzfeld as one of the developers, this guy from the original Macintosh team, um, and he, every time I would sort of talk to him about uh, different projects, I would engage with him, hear some stories and things. He would say, every project is different. Um, and, you know, I think my experience in talking to people is that's true, that there's an impulse that people have that they say, I know what a best practice is here, I know what I should be doing, but there are these unique circumstances this time, and because of those unique circumstances, I just can't do that thing that I know is right. And I hear that uh, in my job. I, I mean, I, maybe some of you encounter that in your work here at Microsoft. Um, my experience is it's pretty universal. There are certainly disciplined teams everywhere that avoid that, and that, either through experience, through good leadership, through whatever reason that you know they say no. You know, we may be unique, but we're not so unique that we shouldn't be doing these things that will help us get to where we're going. And that's real discipline and if you have that or if you have a team leader who's got that or if you have that yourself that's very valuable. Yes? Um, how well do you think the team find uh, principles of open source to develop and then to what extent did that make it, make it easier or harder to do what they did? Because going back to this, this previous question, there are a lot of great open source projects like the Apache Foundation's projects yeah. which don't really have a consistent ship schedule but they do ship. Right. When they ship Pretty good quality, you know. So I'm, I'm interested in, in, in yeah. hearing your your musings about that. So if you chew on that for a bit, I appreciate yeah. it. Open source uh, at Chandler was a little bit different um, because most open source projects start with a code base, right? And there is code of some kind, and then um, one developer maybe starts it. Another few developers kind of join up after the code is posted and um, contribute things and. Uh, it grows kind of organically. Um, and Chandler was interesting in that it was technically open source and that from the very beginning they were posting their code and it was openly available. You could always download it. So it was open source in that sense. But it was not functioning with the open source uh, development model in that the group of people creating it was really closer to a startup team. It was, you know, a bunch of developers working together mostly in one office, although over time they began to have some people uh, working uh, from a distance. And so uh, it, it's taken them, they are at this point finally um, begin in, the, in the project beginning to have the occasional contribution of code from outside. There's one that, that I chronicle uh, late in the book. And so there's the beginning of that, but I, I know that uh, the people I was writing about throughout um, knew that they were frustrated that they hadn't reached that point. Um, they knew that they had to get the product to a certain level of value before other developers would commit to contributing to it. The phrase uh, in the open source world from Eric Raymond's paper about the cathedral and the bazaar is a, plaus a plausible promise. You don't have to have a finished product, but you have to have a plausible promise that the a developer will will uh, find the product useful uh, and will find the, his contribution to be of value. And it took them, uh, it's taken them a long time to get there at Chandler. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned uh, a lot of similarities between software and uh, bridge building and, uh, you know, physical world building. And, uh, you know, bridge bu building in particular is notorious for being over budget and uh, uh, late. So in that sense, there are two uh, questions I want to ask. First is, do you really think that problems that we're seeing in software um, are uh, you know, different from uh, problems that we're seeing in the real world building and architecture and we've been building for thousands of years? And the second is, uh, do you think there is, because you know, we haven't been able to fix the building problems for thousands of years, do you think there's a hope in software? So the first part is, um, you know, aren't, uh, the first question then is, isn't building software and building bridges really m very similar and 
we, we mess up when we build bridges too and we're over budget and all that. Um, and that's true, but the, and we have disasters certainly in bridge building too. We had a lot more of them in the 19th century than we do today. Um, but I still find in my uh, research that the, the big difference is that bridges, people have a, an instinctive understanding of the physical um, nature of the work. They know that you have, you know, before you can, th there's a sequencing to the work that's necessary that even the non-expert understands. You've got to put the pilings in, you know, before you can put the girders up, before you can put the road bed on. It's just kind of obvious that, that the sequencing is, is going to be a certain way. And you also know that once you pour concrete, that's a really bad time to decide that you're going to have uh, a, a new design. Um, although, uh, interestingly, in uh, <laughs> I live in the Bay Area, and one of the things that was happening while I was writing this book is the Bay Bridge is being rebuilt. And lo and behold, they built half of it and then had a big argument with the state legislature about whether they should redesign it at that point. Um, so, so that's kind of funny and, and maybe to your point. Um, so I do think, I think that it, there are aspects in which the, the two really are very similar, but there are a few aspects of software that, that do m make it unique. Um, and do I think we'll ever get there? Um, I don't, my gut feeling is no, is that um, what will happen is that we, we achieve a level of reliability and stability at a layer of software, and then we forget about it. I mean, there's stuff that we don't, generally think about today that 30 years ago or 40 years ago was what programmers had to deal with, whether it's you know, the, uh, at the machine level or you know, higher up, there's this sequencing, this, this piling on of layers that happens. And we're always working on the next layer, and that's the layer that we're kind of fighting with and having difficulty with. And I don't see that process changing. It seems to me that's the nature of software. As long as we're writing software, we're going to be piling these layers on and we'll always be kind of wrestling with whatever the newest one is. Um, I hope, I mean, I, I might be wrong and, and if I am wrong, that'll be a good thing. But this is my conclusion from the work I've done. Anyone else? Yes? So, I mean, do you see is this thing just going to flame out and go? I mean, because you know, I wonder if the similar story couldn't have been written about, you know, the Mozilla Foundation a few years ago, and it was like, oh, this thing's collapsing, it's exactly. a disaster, and then you know they sort of focused on Firefox and it yeah. just took off and it's great, well, right? So that's precisely the comparison that that I used in the book. Um, you know, people come to me and say, well, you know, you've written this book about this failed project, and I actually don't view it as a failed project. It's certainly a project that has had you know, enormous difficulties and delays and there's no, uh, you know, uh, uh, sugarcoating that. Uh, but with Mozilla, I, uh, we ran articles in Salon that said, you know, Mozilla, they're gone, forget it. They, they've started with a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm and then after a year or two, a lot of people left and they made some decisions to rewrite the whole presentation engine or whatever it was and they did, you know, and people criticized that and it took them years and they were written off. And now they're really, you know, sort of contributing something that people are enthusiastic about again. But that uh, rewrite is a super interesting question to ask, yeah. especially relative to bridge building, because the rewrite was done for a very specific reason, which is uh, architecture participation, right? As you design these things to be increasingly modular, then you actually engage the community to come in and start developing mm -hmm. code. So they, the office has gone yeah. through the same restructure from 1.0 to 2.0. So this is, this is a, there's actually some, some fairly deep stuff here that I'd be interested in having somebody write a book about and, and explore, like, how does the architecture interrelate with the ability of the open source project to be successful? So the, the, better, the better architected the application is to allow people to contribute, um, the, the more likely that's going to happen. But getting to that point is arduous. Yeah. Linux's X server, right? The graphics server uh, a couple of years ago was rewritten in version 7. From a, a, a programmer would have to know almost all the code base to modify any of it effectively to this module system where you can just know the little bit that you knew and effectively how to integrate and, and do a little bit of, you know, a little bit of build testing and then you could go. And since then, you know, enormous uh, changes in, in Linux desktop since. So. Yeah, that makes sense. It's just it's about metal capacity. Yeah. yeah. So, well, Chandler. I think, um, it, it, as I understand it, and I'm not an expert, the architecture of it from the beginning has been as modular as it ought to be. <laughs> and um, 
the, you know, the issue has been more uh, just get, getting enough of it in place that a developer could see why they would, would want to be involved. Personally, I'm not um, uh, uh, writing it off at all. I'm still kind of eagerly uh, expecting, hoping that you know, there, there is going to be something there that I can use. There was a vision in the project for uh, Chandler to be more than just a personal information manager, but really to be um, a, a free form information manager that you could adapt to. And they have some cool little kind of uh, almost mashup style plugins that let you pull thing, pull photos in from Flickr and bookmarks in from Delicious and use Chandler as this sort of information center for cataloging and organizing all this stuff that you might have on the computer. You know, similar way to the, that WinFS was, was going to, uh, you know, that, what that promise was. And so um, I, I want that as a user. Uh, and I'm still, I, I'm not certainly writing Chandler off as something that someday might help us do that. Yes, please. Maybe off subject, but I understand the most complicated software around is telephone exchanges. And I never could figure that out because they were built to replace an undertaker's wife. Have you looked <laughs> into that? The telephone exchanges as yes. the most complex software? That's what I'm told. I don't know anything about that, no. Um, it's, I, it sounds like a, an interesting thing to, to look up. Although, I guess it's kind of gradually being, I mean, telephone exchanges are sort of going to become a thing of the past, right? With, with IP telephony and at some point. You said no, to, fo to, I, to phone your I'm mother. Not, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert, so. Uh, you know. Yes. Have you gotten any feedback from people who worked on the Chandler project? On the book. What did they, yeah, what did they, as they read it, what was their yeah. response? The feedback I got, I, I've gotten to date from the people on the project, um, they felt that it was a fair portrait. You know, nobody felt that it was, uh, I had been inaccurate or unfair to them, so I'm pleased about that. I think that they, you know, clearly when, when Mitch invited me in, I know that uh, he was very optimistic that this project was going to, um, be speedier and less troubled than it turned out to be. And to his credit, he never turned to me and said, you know what, I think you better get out of here. Um, and I give him a huge credit for that, for sticking to um, his commitment to opening uh, his project to tr that kind of transparency. Uh, and, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, the, the jury's still out and Chandler isn't, um, you know, over. So, uh, you know, I think that the, the spotlight that the book shines on Chandler, well, um, it's giving them some attention now, and in April they're going to have what they're calling the preview release. It's kind of their next big thing. We'll see what that's like, and uh, maybe the book will will give them some uh, um, something to point to and say, "Well, that was what that was then, and this is now." All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>